Air fuel synthesis is looking for an investment of £5 million to help it construct its first commercial facility, and we would expect there's a project this will return an IRR of around 15%. Air fuel synthesis um, converts renewable energy into transport fuels. That's our, that's our goal, and you can think of it as putting electricity into your fuel tank. It is a different approach. We think it's got plenty of merits. We have a very strong team we've assembled to get us to where we are now. We are um, two years old. We have, we're not trading yet. Um, but we have a, a group of people who are really supportive and, and helping us move this business forwards. And the group of people you see on the screen there consists of the founder members of the organization, the people who, who've brought the idea forward from, um, from, a, from a zero point to in, and also includes now a board team are put together that will actually help us move that vision into uh, reality. That's I see my role in this. So the key uh, people I'd point out on there are myself, Peter Harrison, and I've got a background in the, uh, I'm a civil engineer, uh, background in the uh, offshore sector and the chemical sector, and for the last 10 or 15 years I've been working as a consultant and on developing projects like this. And we have David Still who's a CBE, uh, developed his uh, experience in the offshore sector, being the first uh, offshore wind farm. So when you hear more about our business, you'll see that he, his skills and knowledge play an invaluable role in helping us put projects together. And at the bottom left, one of the founder members is Professor Tony Marmont, who's, uh, whose idea this was way right back in the first place, of how do you make better use of renewable energy. So what sort of markets are we talking about? Well, we're looking at things to do with high volume energy storage and balancing renewable energies, specialist uses for renewable methanol and petrol, for example, integration with thermal and bioenergy projects, improving efficiencies and converting CO2s into petrols, and as a synthetic replacement for fossil fuels. Uh, at least that's our goal. Now, when we look at how scalable is this as a, as a business opportunity, we end up getting concerned about oil price and, and where, what the break-even point is and how we're going to move forward. And I wouldn't want to claim that we are, we are um, competitive with oil at the moment by any means, but we do see niche opportunities for us as a business to help generate a cash flow. So our, our scalability strategy is to start working in niche markets move more into energy storage and energy balancing, and then move towards general transport fuels as our economics come down and the oil price comes up. Uh, and our goal is to move from our demonstration unit, which we've invested just over half a million pounds in up on Teesside, uh, to, to becoming a refinery-based uh, exercise producing these renewable fuels. So our ambitions are enormous, um, but it'll take us a little time, but we think we can do this profitably. Our business model, our technology model, is about taking carbon dioxide and hydrogen using renewable energy to make a carbon neutral fuel, liquid transport fuel. It's one that could be stored as a, as a sort of complementary to hydrogen storage, but perhaps with a slightly easier storability factor to it, but one which as a process sits very well in countries that are developing uh, very large renewable energy um, projects and have a need to have a carbon neutral transport fuel. So places like Scotland are very interested in what we're talking about doing. Our, our core technology is in our fuel systems, our fuel reactor systems and technology, but also in the systems integration which is a bit fledgling at the moment because we're only at demonstrator stage, but that's where the business wants to get to. And we're finding that being very early in the market, looking at the uses of CO2 with pretty much existing technologies leads to IP opportunities, which I think we'll find will be valuable in the future. 
So we've proven the point that we can make methanol and petrol from CO2 and hydrogen. Some people find that obvious, and I'm surprised how many people uh, find that surprising. Uh, as a product, it's a synthetic replacement for fossil fuels. It is a direct substitute for liquid transport fuels. It is carbon neutral, and it can be produced to make petrol, methanol, diesel, jet fuel, and we could go on to make plastics and other products, depending on the market conditions. The business strategy is to develop and improve technology in the demonstrator, which we are doing now, move on to our commercial stage, which we want to do next, and develop partnerships and joint ventures so we can put the larger projects together. So having said that we're ambitious and we want to make a lot of progress over a long, a lot of long time, we're very conscious that we need to generate a cash flow in what might seem to be quite a difficult uh, marketplace at the moment. We believe, however, we found an opportunity in the, in the motorsport sector where our um, renewable hydrocarbon drop-in replacement fuel will make an excellent blend product for example in the F1 circuit where they have a, a 6% requirement for biofuels. And this is where we are intending to invest our first £5 million. Uh, one of the benefits of our project is we're making transport fuels but our, our operating costs are are very, very low. We're not relying on any raw materials, CO2 from the air, and, and electricity to make the hydrogen. So uh, you can predict well into the future what your manufacturing costs are, and I think this is quite a commercial advantage in oil, with oil prices rising. The company is an experienced and capable team. We've got a very strong strategy, We're commercially sustainable. That's our, that's our motto, uh, and we are ambitious. And from an investment point of view, the highlights would be that we're talking about a very scalable business up from container sales, up, or, of containerized units selling fuel up to refinery scale. Um, the very low feedstock cost means that we've got increasing margins naturally, and we're not competing against food crops. And the first in the market opportunities are helpful, and the cash, uh, cash positive at the beginning without requiring fiscal support. And what I mean by that is when we look at the, the forecast models of our product, we don't include the opportunity to include um, renewable obligations or road traffic fuel certificates. And uh, that would be a bonus as far as we're concerned. <coughs> so uh, thank you very much for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Yeah. Peter, you said you take CO2 out of the air. Um, is, that, is that just the surrounding air, or is that at, at the point source, um, say, say, a big CO2 manufacturer? I'll just look the tongue. I have to say, our founders are very, very enthusiastic about taking CO2 out of the air. A lot of my job for the first six months of this year has been helping my founder understand the realities of the commercial world uh, and focus on point sources of CO2. Yeah. We've now got there, so we've got a happy team now. <laughs> and, uh, but point sources of CO2, if we can find it from, say, a bioethanol source mm. or a waste-to-energy project or a brewery or a fermentation project of some sort, that would be ideal. Well, I guess, I guess part of your business could be to help these guys uh, reduce their carbon output. Absolutely, yeah. yes. yes. So. It sounds like a very simple process, but then the question is why aren't other people doing it? Are there low barriers to entry or quite high barriers to entry? I'm not sure about this. I think maybe because we're turning things on the head a bit. Right. When we talk to, um, when I come from a bit of a chemical background, so I would say this is obvious, you know, that as a refinery process. It's black magic to me. But, it's not, <laughs> but exactly. And that's, and, that's, and that's the dilemma. That's the opportunity. A lot of people see it as black magic. How can you do that? Well, as a, as a, chemical, as a chemical background, you can say, well, you can do that. Mm -hmm. the, the question at the moment is, can you do it economically and commercially? Uh, and until the last six months, when we, when we actually were able to talk to um, the, uh, the motorsport sector about what we were doing and find out what the interest is, then uh, you know, we didn't really have a model, but now we do have a model. It's about stepping forwards, creating cash flow, so we can develop further, and as the, as the world changes, our project becomes more viable. That's our approach. When do you expect that to happen? Ah. I mean, everything you say is based ah. on the oil price. You've just assumed that the oil price goes that way all, all the time. When do you expect to be e economic? Oh, it can be economic tomorrow. 
in our particular niche market. But when can we compete against oil? I, I don't know. It might be 10 years. Right. So what, what is your cost of production at the moment for your pilot plant you're proposing and then for, let's say, the next generation plant? What is the cost of, yeah, this, it, of this plant? A rough cost of production in dollars per barrel. Uh, this, this next plant is going to cost us, uh, we're, we're expecting it to cost us about four million pounds for 1,200 litres a day. Four million pounds for two, okay. Okay. It's, it, it does sound really kind of quite a unique and interesting proposition. Um, so point sources of CO2, what, what kind, says here you're looking at kind of breweries and bioethanol mm. plants. Have you kind of mapped where you get point source of CO2 and kind of spill renewable power as a kind of sweet spot for where you might want to target production facilities? We're looking very hard at Scotland at the moment. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of interest from the distilleries up there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've given my team a, a, a motivation call. I said, look, I want to retire touring the F1 circuits. In the, in the season and then going and touring the breweries and the distilleries in the other seasons. <laughs> That's basically drink driving. Exactly. <laughs> so you're, you're assuming um, raising oil prices, but are there other things that you're doing that you could bring the price down? And are you also watching at natural gas prices? Is, is that dangerous for you? Yeah, well, thank you for that question. Um, Going from a, going from a one ton a day containerized unit, and we can see that quite easily, and we can design that quite easily. You'll see our paperwork upstairs. We we have a concept of a thousand ton a day plant, which is the size of a bioethanol project, which sounds quite straightforward. And if it was bioethanol project, it would be a few hundred million. For our project, it's going to be a few billion to get that size, because all the all the costs from all your raw materials are brought forward and basically you're creating your oil at the beginning. Um, and that sounds like a very large number, but then it's also a very large number to put back into the supply chain. And then, you know, when I talked to Graham Cooley about his hydrogen electrolyzer, and they said, well, okay, you're making a one megawatt one. What happens if I want a thousand of them? What happens to your manufacturing costs and what kind of deal could we do? And we're generally finding that people are saying, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of it would make a lot of difference to us as suppliers to be able to respond to the orders of that size. Um, so the, what, as we move forward, we want to be able to stimulate these discussions and find ways of getting people to reduce those costs, getting people involved in our projects uh, and creating jobs at the same time. So, thank you. Thank you very much.